So welcome. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, so I decided to think about empathy and TWT. I should probably introduce myself. Now I'm feeling like really conscious because we've decided yeah, to record it. It's not. Yeah. <laughs> we decided to record it. Okay, because I'm thinking I'm talking to two people that I know. Uh, so I'm Melissa Johnson. I'm faculty in early childhood education and habits of mind experience faculty. And I have been teaching a uh, first year seminar or TWP since I looked this up since the fall of 2017, which was a lot longer than I thought. Um, I kind of think like this is somehow a new part of my work, but it really isn't that new anymore. Um, so there's a couple of goals for the presentation today. Uh, one thing I'd like to do is share a little bit about how I came to focus on empathy with TWP. Um, I want to share a little bit about my thinking related to uh, how empathy connects to different aspects of the course and I'd also like to share the questions that I'm using to guide the work that we're doing in TWP by getting us to think a little bit about those questions, but then also sharing how I've approached it in terms of the course itself, in terms of more specifics, like what are the activities that we're doing. So uh, if you want to follow along on the slides, you can grab that QR code and it will bring you to the slide deck that might be helpful later on if there are links that you want to access. So just give everyone a second to do that if they would like. Everyone set that wants the slides? Uh, so there were several different things that sort of brought me to this place um, when I'm thinking about empathy and how I landed there. Um, the first piece is that when the last time I taught the course in the fall of 2021, I felt a little challenged by the work. Um, I felt that we had a good start to our semester and then things started to shift when we started to do our group work and I was wondering what was happening there and um, you know I even got to a point where I was like sort of like not sure how to to move forward with the group like we had the groups had disengaged and I wasn't sure how to get them back and and engage them and so for me as a professor, that felt a little bit like a failure um, because I wasn't sure what to do next. So I knew that I wanted to do something different this fall. And so that is that's that was the main purpose that I decided to focus on this work. Um, the other thing that I mean, I think all of us have this, right? I think everyone, the pandemic has pushed them as instructors has made them think about teaching in a different way. And um, I would say for me, the pandemic really pushed me to, uh, to think more quickly about some ideas that I had been working on even before the pandemic. I had been questioning my own pedagogy and sort of the structures that I had in place. Why am I doing the things I'm doing? Um, is it for me? Is it for the students? Like I was really having some 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 really tough reflections to kind of think about my teaching and the pandemic just made me ask those questions much like quicker than I thought I was going to address them in everything I was doing because you know when people are in crisis mode it makes you just kind of think about like what can I do differently and so things like flexibility and and uh, choice and ungrading which were really emerging my work just really came to the forefront and that was I mean, it was evident in all of my work, but I feel like the spring, um, last spring was really, I just, I mean, for 
I felt the best about my teaching I have ever felt in the spring of 2020. So I went from sort of feeling low at the end of fall semester to having like a really, really um, thriving semester as a professor. And so I was trying to think about like some of the things that were happening. What was I doing? How was I supporting students? And I think one of the places I saw it the most was in a play class I teach. It's that's also a wellness connection course. And I think I picked, I, I was sort of thinking about that course quite a bit, partly because it was a course that I worked on during my sabbatical the previous year, but also because it's a general education course, I don't know the students at the beginning of the semester. Like when I'm teaching courses in the major, like a lot of times I have pre-existing relationships. So I'm coming into the work in a little bit of a different space, but with the play class that helped me see like, to, or help me think about like what am I doing with these students that's allowing to build relationships to build engagement that maybe I could bring into my work with um, first year students because that was something I was thinking about. So in order to help me do this work, I decided that I was going to enlist Martha from the collab because I actually partly because I, I thought she'd be amazing to talk to but also I just needed I needed to have like something on my calendar each week to help me stay focused on this work because um, it's really challenging sometimes in the midst of the semester to find the time. And I really had the goal of um, not doing this work this summer. So I met with Martha, I think we met like almost every week, the second half of the semester. And, you know, when I first started with, with Martha, I just, I kind of was like, I want to work on my small group um, aspect of the course. But, you know, as most things happen, you realize it's not just one part of the course. And I realized through the conversations with Martha that really I had to redesign the whole course. And as we were talking about like what was working, what wasn't working, we were pulling in ideas about what, what I was doing in the spring, what I had been reflecting on, Somehow through those conversations, this empathy thread emerged because it seemed like we kept coming back to this idea of perspective. And so I wish I had documented it better because it was the, the conversations we have are so interesting. So we should have recorded every session. <laughs> I guess so. We should have recorded every session. And um, but so needless to say, that's sort of how I landed on um, this idea of empathy. So part of, part of our discussion, we were thinking about the course. And so I think it's helpful for us to see where I saw empathy in the TWP experience. So um, I know instructors um, have different ways to support students in terms of the project development aspect of the course. Um, and most often the way I've approached that is through design thinking. Um, and if you're familiar with design thinking, you know that one of the things that you think about is empathy in terms of helping you understand the perspectives of the people that you're trying to make a change for. Um, so I thought that was that was that interesting piece that had the empathy connection. I also thought about um, it's interesting when you start to think about a concept, you start seeing it in more places and in, in even unexpected places that you hadn't thought about before. So I was looking at the habits of mind and I started seeing like, hmm, you know, when I think about this signpost, this really seems like I'm focusing on empathy as well. So that seemed like another thread or connection to this idea. And then when I think about the course structure, these are ideas that I mentioned before. So one of the things I've been really focused on is ungrading. And I think for me, where I connect to empathy is I'm thinking about the student perspective. I'm thinking about their course experience. And it's not just ungrading that is in the course structure that helps me with that, but it is with um, everything I do in terms of the way we design, I design the activities, but also when I think about um, the structures I have in place. So 
I want to keep these in mind as I talk about these different ideas to help you see those connections. So these are the questions that we're going to explore together. Um, and these are the questions I use to help me think about how I might include an empathy thread in my courses or my sections. So I'll go through each one so we can talk a little bit about it. So the first thing I was thinking about was how could we think about just what is empathy? I think if, if I'm going to focus on empathy, I have to think about what do students already know about empathy and so I thought that would be a good starting place for our work. So I thought um, maybe so that we can engage a little bit in this work as well, I thought we could start off by thinking about what's our perspective. Like when you hear empathy, what comes to mind and what are your initial thoughts? And there's only, there's only a few of us in the space. So just feel free to unmute mute and share your thinking. When I, when I think about empathy, I think it's really trying to understand whatever we're talking about from another person's perspective and not superficially, but really understand what their concerns and their thoughts are about the situation. Yeah. Yeah, I think I go ahead, Libby. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I think really similarly um around empathy. And I always think about empathy, you know, in contrast to sympathy. So really it is what Kathy was saying, you know, that like, okay, if I were in your shoes, right? Like how would how might I feel, right? And kind of how do we move from there? Um Um, I think that it's a word I still like, I still struggle to understand it completely. Like, I feel like it's a much more complicated concept than I probably realized, you know, earlier in my career. And I think I shared the, we had a session about, we did something with empathy last spring. And I think I shared this anecdote and there were some people, including Libby, who was in, I think Libby was in that session. There were some other people, maybe through psych or social work. I can't remember who, maybe Allison Mitchell. And I was sharing what my therapist had told me years ago when my children were born about developing children with empathy, developing children with empathy, about helping your children be, become like <coughs> empathetic people. And I remember my therapist saying that it isn't really, it's kind of like the, like the, like the whole, like, don't do drugs thing. Like we don't actually get kids not to do drugs by telling them don't do drugs like all the research shows that. And it was the same thing with empathy. You can't just like tell people to be empathetic. And, but so what she said was the way that like in her experience and in her research, it was by being empathetic to others that helps foster empathy in them. But I feel like in that meeting, even somebody, again, somebody who has more disciplinary expertise in this pushed back on that a little bit, which I really appreciate. And just brings me back to where I started, which is that like, it's actually really complicated, I think, the concept of empathy, how we develop it in, our, it in ourselves, how we foster it in other people or in situations or learning experiences, and maybe most importantly, how we dig down to get past, like as Libby said, that like, and, and Kathy said about like that surface level to really think about what we mean when we talk about empathy. That's so, long. Yeah, I will add like this to me. So I was lucky in, I'm a computer science PhD, right? So when I ha had my um, bachelor's degree in computer science, I feel really lucky that my first job out of uh, undergrad was for a small company where empathy was at the heart of what we did. And it, it was at the heart of our software development, which, you know, it seems like this would not be connected. But we, I think, actually developed software that succeeded because of our approach to empathy with the people who are going to use our software. So we would, like, we avoided meetings with middle management. We always had meetings with the people who are actually going to use the software because we wanted to understand their, the way they actually work. 
and then develop software that supports that as opposed to talking to middle management who thinks they understand how, how things should work and then building software that, that met that. I always felt like that was, I was so lucky to have that as my formative experience in computer science because it's kind of colored pretty much everything else I've ever done. You know, when, when Kathy, when you were speaking, it, I was just thinking so much of design thinking and how you had the opportunity to apply that in your professional career. Um, and that's, you know, one of the places that I start this converse or I decided to start this conversation with the students because um, I decided that design thinking is the structure, even though I have this empathy thread, um, I want to help them think about that design thinking process. So. One of the things we did the very first day of class is um, I asked my sections if anybody had used design thinking before, if they had heard about it, um, and that was not something they were familiar with, which you know I didn't really anticipate it would be, but I wasn't sure. Um, I, I actually showed them a short uh, clip um, this is like my early childhood perspective always coming in. I'm always interested in seeing how children use pretty complex ideas in their work. And part of the reason is because I think um, we underestimate children, but also I think sometimes when we are adults and then we, we sort of see, oh, this seems really hard, um, sometimes seeing how children approach it might be helpful. So I found a pretty great video about a second grade classroom and how they approach design thinking. And so I use that as a starting place for a conversation of what is design thinking? What are the different aspects of design thinking? And then to use that as what empathy is one part of it, um, what are our ideas about empathy? Um, so the Jamboard link that you see there and the Google slide deck, um, those are examples of some of the work that we pulled together in the first week of our class for one of my sections in terms of their emergent thinking. So not, none of this is like saying like this is all uh, accurate information, but it's how they're processing the information and these ex experiences I'm really trying not to share my thinking as much, but I want them to have space to construct knowledge and share that with their peers. And these are spaces we can go back to as we are thinking more about it. And then um, I, I actually curated um, from a variety of different resources, um, readings that were specific to what is empathy um, to help students think more deeply about um, that piece. And uh, if you go through to the end of the slide deck, I actually wrote a post about all of this work. And on my blog post, I have all the links to the readings that I've put together. Um, I have it in, in Canvas and I didn't know how to share that as a link right here. So, but you can access it for sure. And what I tried to do as I was creating um, this list of resources for students to read is trying to get different perspectives. So like many of the ideas that were mentioned when I asked you about what is empathy were addressed in those articles, but then also things like, you know, one of the articles that I think was mentioned was like, is there a dark side to empathy? And what does it mean if we empathize too much? And is there a drain? Um, so giving students these opportunities to think about empathy in different ways and then coming back together, um, they made choices about what they want to read and then coming back together and how can we learn from each other, what commonalities are we seeing. And so one of the last slides that you'll see in this Google uh, slide deck that we created is some of those commonalities that they saw across those readings as they're trying to construct um, what is empathy. So that was really one thing that we tried to do in the, um, the first couple of weeks is get an understanding. If we're gonna be talking about empathy, what do we think it means within design thinking, but then also um, in general in other contexts. So 
one of the parts that really excited me about having a focus on empathy at the beginning of the semester in particular is that I spend a lot of time trying to learn about my students and to encourage them to learn about each other. So I felt like empathy would be a way, um, a connection to this work that I was already doing. I just never really thought about it um, so succinctly before. So I thought um, maybe it might be interesting to talk a little bit about maybe in your prior courses or in your experiences as a student, um, what are some ways that you have learned about other people's perspectives in these learning spaces that you've been a part of? Is this a question you're asking us? Yes, Kathy, I was cur curious, yeah. like what your perspective was like, from your experiences, what are some of the ways that you've done this work, even if you didn't call it empathy? Yeah. So at the beginning of every class I do, I don't call it a learning inventory, but that's basically what it is, where I um, ask students questions like, well, first of all, you know, what's your name? What do you prefer to be called? What do you want me to know about you? But I, but I also ask questions like, how does this room that we're in it, what, what how do you feel in this room like are there things that are going to distract you are the lights buzzing is it you know things that i i should know about their um existence in this learning space together i do that at the beginning of every semester yeah i'm I just jotting that. down uh, the room idea. I, ha I I had never thought about that question for the learning survey. Yeah, I took the I took a cue from Kathy on that too, and I did a, a learning needs survey. I did some research um, on on like various ways to conduct and what to include in a learning needs survey um, to create my own. Um, and I'm really glad that you know this is my first time teaching in general <laughs> at the collegiate level. Um, I'm really glad that I did that, especially as someone with um, disabilities myself. Um, you know, it really did give me a, a great sense of um, of empathy, but also just like knowing what is going on for each student. And it was really interesting. What I noticed, um, and I need to reach out to some folks about this, was that a lot of students. I actually did this on the second or third class meeting. I think it was the second. Um, and already, like we had had, you know, the first class in our assigned space, um, and almost every student noted that something a barrier to their learning was the physical space that we are assigned. Um, it's very cramped. Um, there was no cooling, um, you know. So like our first couple uh, classes were very, it was very hot outside, so it was very hot in the room. Um, so I did what I could to, you know, make the class meeting shorter um, to help with that. Um, but I got a lot of insight into what's going on for each student, what other responsibilities do they have, um, and what kind of supports might they need. I haven't quite like brought it full circle to, uh, but I just had the thought like, oh, maybe I should, you know, in our class tomorrow or something, right? Be like, okay, so I did look at all your learning needs surveys. That was not like a moot point. And here's some commonalities. Um, so let's brainstorm, like here's some options to kind of work with these barriers that we can see, you know, um, we're already having to this class being what we want it to be. Yeah, I'm trying to think if I've ever done anything really that I would, well, like a, an activity in class that does what we're talking about here. It makes me think a little bit about, I guess a lot about this thing that came across, like I think my Facebook feed this yesterday or the day before. And it was, um, it was like a, it was kind of a clickbaity, like feel good. Oh, maybe, maybe it was somebody I know who shared it, but I feel like maybe it just showed up without me knowing where it came from. But it was like a middle school teacher who had his students, they did like an exercise where he had his students write down on index cards, 
and I can't remember what the prompt was. I think it was something, I think it was like some, what's something that you're struggling with right now. Um, and it was anonymous, right? They just, they filled these out and turned them in. And then he had students in the class read them other people's out loud. Um, and he said it was just this really powerful experience for the students, not just to hear them, but to have to read them, I think. Um, and it was an interesting idea. It, like part of me also was like, you know, I'm sure in the way he explained it, he they knew that this, like he made it clear that like what they shared would be, you know, would be shared. Because obviously you wouldn't want somebody to disclose something and then have that be a shock to them when it's shared with the classroom. So you have to think a little bit about how you go about doing that. But um, it's interesting too to think about what kind of prompts you could maybe use for that, about like, what are you struggling with or what's something you wish people knew about you that they don't, or um, just you know to do that in a way that's both reassuring and safe but also could potentially be really empowering and a way for students to really view, really get inside, inside of maybe someone else's experience. Yeah, uh, I, I think that, Martha, you, you bring up this interesting piece about like, um, thinking about like how sharing somebody else's perspective, right. how that might be different than hearing somebody mm -hmm. else's perspective. Yeah. Um, hadn't really thought about that before. I guess it's like the assignment we always used to have to do where you'd interview somebody and then you'd have yeah. to introduce them to the class. Like it's trying to get at the same sort of thing. Although I don't feel like that assignment necessarily elicited the same thing, at least for me when I would do it. Yeah. Because I don't know I'm why. A, I'm assuming if you're doing like, what are you struggling with? You spent some time together. Right. And you've had, had some right. shared experiences. Right which feels different than you're introducing somebody you don't know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so there, this, as I was putting together the slide, I was thinking, I, I, I put some things on the slide, but as I was doing this, I'm like, well, the whole entire class is actually this because I'm constantly pushing my students to talk to one another, to talk to different people. We're grouping in different ways. Um, but these are some specific things that I, thought about at the beginning um, to help with learning about other people's perspectives. So some of them are really simple things that I do no matter what the course is. Like I cre always create index cards to start off um, with a new group of students where I just have their picture and the name that's listed um, in my Plymouth. And then I, I have them find their own cards the first day and put like things like Kathy kind of mentioned some of the stuff that she had on, on her learning survey where it's like, what name would you like me to use? What are your pronouns? What's something you want me to know? And then I use those and I tell the students the purpose for them is like, so I can learn who you are. I want to use your name. So tell me how you want to be um, represented. And I actually just had one of my sections um, right before I started this presentation. And one of the students on the very first day, we were talking about something and he said, I want to learn everybody's name in this class. So since we were finishing week three, I said, I was like, so I'm curious, how, how are you on learning everybody's name? He's like, oh, I've been working on it, but not that great. <laughs> right. And so then I asked other students about how many names do you think you know? Do you know one other person? Do you know five other people? And there were two students that thought they know, knew almost everybody except for a couple of people, which I was really impressed. And then somebody said, well, I bet there's nobody who knows everybody. And I said, well, I do. And then like one of the students said, you do? And I'm like, well, I've been using your name, haven't I? And then they were like, kind of thought about it. <laughs> um, I'm like, I've been using those index cards. So it was just like a perfect yeah. um, thing to kind of think about. So that that's really like a simple piece. But um, we do something, this is actually something that I stole from Pat Cantor. Um, those of you who know her is, um, I do a go around every day every class day to start off the class. And it's a, it's a question that everybody answers. Um, and the question varies. So like during the first week, they were more like get to know you questions, like something like, what is your favorite snack food? Something that's easy for people to access without feeling like they're oversharing, but that we can start just learning about each other. But then as we get into the course, like it can be things like that I'm wondering about like, 
for instance, they're going to be doing a, a reflection journal. Um, so today I asked them, where are they in their process? Have they figured out the for, like what modalities they wanna use, what tools they're gonna use? Just basically trying to check in, like have they thought about this? Um, and so that they also can hear from each other about ways that they might be approaching it. Um, during the first week of class, one of the questions I asked them to learn about their perspective is like, why did they decide to take this particular section of TWP? Um, and I said, it's okay if you just picked it because it was fitting your schedule. You know, I gave them some, some options so they didn't feel like they had to like come up with something because I really did want to, to know their perspective on that. One of their, um, one of the very first assignments the students did to help to learn about each other was we use um, one pagers uh, in my class. And so the first one pager that they developed was actually a one pager about themselves. So in class, we talked about like, what might they wanna learn about each other and um, get a list and they could pick anything off that list to share or anything else they thought of that they wanted to share about themselves. And so they submitted it to me, but then also on the day they submitted that assignment, we basically had a little gallery walk of our personal perspectives so that they had an opportunity to start making connections with their peers. Like, you know, and I told them when I looked at their personal perspectives, when I gave them feedback, I started mentioning some of the things that I noticed, like, oh, I saw that we had two connections to Brazil in our class. And we had, you know, so so that they are seeing that I'm also interested in their perspective. I think that was um, Libby, you were saying that earlier, that like helping them see that you're not just asking them to do it, but you're really wanting to make sense of it and support them, whatever it happens to be. So there's lots of ways that the students are learning about each other and lots of ways that I'm trying to make sense of who they are. And we're just, you know, it's just week three. So I still have a lot to learn and to do on this part. Um, so this, this question here um, really stems from helping the students kind of think about their prior experiences in school and how this course might be a little bit different from what they've done before and how their prior work might influence like how we're going to work together. And we have just started this conversation this semester. And so one of the ways that we started this was I asked them, what do they know about the course on the first day? Like, what have they heard about TWP? What do they think they'll be doing in the course? Um, to get them to start thinking about like, what what might this look like? And then their first readings in the class were to read the syllabus, the calendar, to look at the OER, the sections that tell us about what is a wicked problem and what um, what is tackling a wicked problem. And then we came back together and used that that knowledge to then talk about like, well, what are you wondering? What did you notice when you see this in the syllabus? What do you think this means? What questions do you have about that? And really went from what they were thinking about and curious about um, as a starting point. There were there's always a list that I have just in case certain conversations don't come up that I think are particularly <laughs> important that I'll bring forward. We spent time thinking about um, in the first couple of weeks, like because I use ungrading in the course, what does that mean? So that last um, bullet point there. I used um, the case against grades. I picked a couple of quotes from that particular reading and I asked the students to talk in small groups about which of those quotes resonated to them in terms of their experiences with grades. And that gave us a, a foundation to talk about um, how, how ungrading how we would approach ungrading the course, but also how it might feel really uncomfortable to them because of their prior experiences. And um, we definitely have more work to do. How did that conversation go? Um, it was great. I had never used this um, article before as a starting point. Yep. So 
our go around that day was to to share a memory that they had about grades. Oh, how did, what was that like? Um, it was interesting because some of them really had, they talked about stress, anxiety, yeah. but then there were others that I think um, were talking about things like, I know like how I'm doing. Um, right. I know- I can chart my progress. Yeah, like, so there was like definitely, yeah. Yeah. definitely a variety of viewpoints. And so then I brought forward the three quotes. And so then they could read them, think about them, and then talk with somebody else. And then we, that helped us, like everyone, it seemed to be found something they identified with about, oh, I hadn't thought about it in this yeah. way. That, yeah, I've done that. I've tried to do the simplest thing right. <laughs> because I want to make sure that I get an A on this assignment, not because I'm really interested in that particular right. topic. So. It gave us a starting point for the conversation, and I'm sure there's going to be more work. I know that I know there's more work to do on this. Um, so that's that's where I'm trying to. And if you're thinking about empathy, like as I introduce this to my students, I talk about um, how I why I've made the choices I've made, and bringing in my perspective as the instructor that it's not just like oh i just made this decision but it there's a thought process behind it and really ultimately i want to hear more about your perspective on your learning process than what i think you're doing in your learning process so i was just going to jump in and say what you just said elizabeth about um, you know, having the conversation about grades and their experiences with grades and then providing your perspective. I think you're doing what Martha said her um, counselor told her that, you know, you don't raise empathetic children by telling them to be empathetic. You demonstrate empathy towards them. And that's what you're doing with your students. I love it. It's great. Thanks, Kathy. Yeah, I'm thinking so, like if I like when I go to to say, OK, here's a leading learning needs survey we do um, and try to integrate more activities around getting to know each other as a community. Um, yeah, like, OK, and, and like here's some of my own barriers, right? I've already shared like one of my disabilities with them, you know, to try to build that like, yeah, I'm a person, too, and I've got some stuff, too. Like, I'm not a perfect uh, teacher. I'm not a perfect anything. Right. Um, yeah, the, by demonstration, yes. Uh, thanks for sharing those perspectives. Uh, so as you all, as everyone knows, the habits of mind are really the focus of much of the work that we do in tackling a wicked problem. And so as I was looking at the habits of mind, I was thinking about empathy as well. And so I thought it might be interesting if maybe we look at the habits of mind and talk a little bit about where we see empathy um, as a starting point to this conversation. So if you have the slides, you can kind of work through it on, you know, on your own, or we could talk, it's a small group, we could talk about it together, but each of the next four slides has the signposts and what base camp is, because that's really the focus for TWP, where we're hoping the students will be at the end of their um, at the end of the semester. Like, where do you see potential for developing empathy within the habits of mind? So I don't know if we want to do this as a group or if we want to spend some time looking and then talking about it. I feel let's do it as a group. We're small enough. Okay. Yeah. So at, does everyone have, um, everyone can see the first purposeful communication? Yeah. So take a minute to sort of remind yourself of the signposts. And are you noticing anything that might help develop empathy? I would say awareness of context to me is all about having an empathetic lens, right? Recognizing that different contexts exist than the one that you sit in um, to me is like the very first step of 
beginning to, you know, practice empathy, um, getting past those assumptions that everybody else's life, life is like yours. <laughs> I, I actually really like that. I mean, this this is a really interesting exercise because, I mean, I you know I know these pretty pretty much by heart. Yeah, like and I your, never. What was that? I was, I was like, you can recite these in your sleep. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I, it had never occurred to me until I saw it in this context to think about historical and cultural context setting as a way of. Um, developing and expressing empathy. But I agree with you, Martha. That's exactly what that's all about. It's, it's interesting too, because it takes what I think very often probably feels like a more kind of an academic concept and makes it feel much more personal, personally relevant to humans, right? Like yep. understanding context as like an academic practice is obviously important in lots of different fields, but it kind of extends that to something much more personal. Yeah, for some students may feel more relatable. Even this whole, both the next two have, have paraphr paraphrasing and summarizing. I mean, this is what counselors do, right? They always paraphrase and summarize. Um, oh, yeah. Bye Libby. <laughs> um, paraphrasing and summarizing as a way <laughs> of, like showing that they understand you. So, I mean, even that can be framed in the sense of this is a way of developing empathy with the author of a text. Right. Yeah, I mean, the one that resonates most with me is the last signpost mm -hmm. because I think about that quite a bit. I actually, um, this week I shared with my students um, my because they're doing these reflective journals and I'm encouraging them to reflect each week I shared my reflection from the first week that we were doing this and I actually wrote about effective application of strategies and sort of um, my experience in the first couple of weeks about um, what I've learned from them and how I'm thinking about like am I communicating my message are they understanding it what are the activities that we've done and how how, what information am I getting from how they approach their uh, personal perspective one pagers that helps me know, do they understand the goals of this activity? Uh, so I use that as a way to share um, my reflective process with them so they could start thinking about those ideas. Um, so the next uh, habit of mind is problem solving. Where might there be empathy here? You know, I, I, I don't, I, I don't know that I see explicit statements that I would identify with empathy here, but I think the approach that you take to problem solving, like, for example, recognizes general challenges to solving the problem, like from whose perspective is a really important question to be asking, right? And so even though that statement doesn't resonate with empathy to me. I think in order to do that well, you have to be empathetic. You have to be looking at things from different perspectives. Um, it's interesting you brought that up because that's um, one of the things I did with my students is they read about the habits of mind and then I gave them these, these signposts and asked them to find empathy. And that's one of the things that the students brought forward. And in their their words, but that's what they were thinking about. Yeah. Um, with that with that particular signpost. Um, what about integrated perspective? I mean, this is empathy, right? <laughs> and that's what you yeah. know. 
This one is, I think it's interesting because for students, I find this is one that's maybe the most challenging for them early in the semester. They're, they're not as sure about this as purposeful communication, problem solving, and self-regulated learning. They've yeah. all had experiences with that, I, but this seems a little bit more abstract. Mm -hmm. But when we were talking about it, even though the students still were a little unsure about it, I think yeah. like once I mentioned like, well, can't you see the empathy here? Like yeah. I see it everywhere. They started and was like, oh, um, like, cause they had now something to connect it with. Because absolutely. We, like, Isn't that about so it. interesting how like, you have an abstract concept like this and you just look at it through a slightly different lens you give them a slightly different lens to apply to it and suddenly it like kind of brick cracks it open it's so cool yeah yeah and then of course yeah. we have self-regulated learning yeah i mean i i think anytime you are articulating your particular perspective as a perspective, <laughs> as opposed to this is the way the world is. I think that's a key step in developing empathy. And so this is like identifying your own strengths and weaknesses. Those aren't everybody's, but they're your own. So that articulation of your perspective as a perspective, I think is really important. It also gets at like this potential concept of self empathy, which seems a little bit like why would you need to have empathy for yourself but actually I think a lot of people aren't very good at practicing yep. that you know so recognizing that you are you are also a person deserving of that care and attention and self-regulated learning is really about you being able to center your own particular needs and context in those ways that help you right like it doesn't mean that you get to say what everybody does but it does mean you get to make decisions about yourself and Martha, that's what one of one of my students said. It's not the same thing. You have to have empathy for yourself yeah. sometimes. Yeah. And really, like, I mean, that's such a good point, Kathy. Yeah. It's like you can't really understand the other until you understand that you are also an individual, right? Like it's really about kind of a, a coming to a self-awareness or consciousness. Yeah. So interesting. Yeah. So that I mean, basically what I mentioned before is what I've done so far with the students is, you know, they've read about the habits of mind. They, we, we talked about them in class. They thought about it through the empathy lens and they did, did, did start having some conversations about like which signposts maybe they've had some time to work on so far this semester. But um, it's definitely a, a conversation that will continue as we do our work. So the, the last question that informs this thread of empathy is brings us back to the wicked problem. So uh, the, the wicked problem for both sections of um, TWP that I'm teaching are climate change, but you could add in whatever wicked problem you're focusing like, how can we use empathy to understand other people's perspectives? So I'm curious, um, how have you, done this in the work in your courses, what have you done with your wicked problem to understand different people's perspectives? I can talk about disinformation. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, talk about differing perspectives, right? Like you can't get more different than what we see on social media in terms of disinformation. And so one of the approaches that I've often taken to that is to start the conversation by not um, sort of evaluating, right? Not judging the actual content of whatever it is that we're looking at, but instead focusing on the skills that you can use by which to evaluate other people's statements to determine whether their opinion or fact, and, and I'm, I can't, no, no, if you can see, I'm putting fact in quotes, right? Um, and, and then we have a conversation about opinion, right? And that is a way of getting at the idea that different people have different perspectives.
So I'm gonna, I'm, I, I know not everyone's had a chance to share. I'm gonna move forward just being mindful of the time. So the way we've approached it in thinking about uh, climate change, um, I thought one of the ways that we might start doing this work is thinking about what are our own perspectives, because I think that's helpful to sort of know what your beliefs are, what you're thinking about, um, so that you can have that understanding that then also think about, well, if this is what I'm thinking about, what other perspectives might help me think about this wicked problem in a different way? Like, how could I learn more from somebody who thinks maybe in a different, has a different experience with it or <laughs> a different mindset? So I found this amazing survey that came out of Yale, the Climate Change in the American Mind Survey. Mm -hmm. And so I had the students complete that for themselves um, during class. And then if you click on that link, um, one of the things that I really appreciated about it is they spent a lot of time, the last time, the data they have there is from 2021. They have all of these amazing maps and graphs and ways that you can learn about how Americans completed the survey. Mm -hmm. So once the students did their own perspectives, they talked with their peers to learn about just like what their peers were thinking. And then I asked them to go into the maps and the data to see how their thoughts reflected you could look at the whole country or you could look at a specific state or a specific county. And so they were starting to explore like, oh, for this question, what are people thinking about? So that was really like a starting point for understanding perspectives. Um, this week, they've been watching videos on people's perspectives on climate change. And so there's quite a variety. Most of them are TED Talks um, that uh, help us think about like maybe the perspective is a parent whose child has been somehow influenced by climate change, or maybe it's from helping us understand how maybe where you live in the world might influence um, your perspective on climate change. Uh, so they have the opportunity to pick some of those to watch, to begin thinking about other people's perspectives and then in class this week, they've been sharing with each other what they learned. So then um, their next step now is to think which perspectives are missing, what do they, which perspectives do they want to hear from. And so they're going to be, their assignment that they're working on right now is they're going to look for someone they can interview mm -hmm. that would give them a different perspective on climate change. Um, so those are some of the ways right now that we're going to be exploring this aspect of empathy in terms of um, thinking about design thinking, thinking about our wicked problem. And so uh, basically where we go from here, although I, empathy will be in every, it's not like we're gonna just like leave empathy behind, but we are going to continue through the de um, design thinking process. So, um, for defining the problem, we're going to work together on this um, work. And I see this is where um, a lot of the information literacy aspects of the course are going to be introduced. And we're going to be um, working with our library liaison to do our library sessions. And um, I've never done this before, but I basically am going to um, have them collaboratively define the problem. So coming up with um, a shared space where they're sharing what they know, what they're learning, and sort of trying to make sense of what is climate change, and then collaboratively work on the ideate part of it. So coming up with as many potential ideas as possible, and then one of their assignments will be to come up with a prototype proposal. And so they'll take one of the ideas they're really excited about, and then sort of make a case of why we should move that idea forward. And so I mentioned that because we're gonna do all of this whole group. And so they won't get into groups until the we've selected maybe the four or five prototypes that we think have the, the um, like sort of the potential to make the most change or the potential for something that we're excited about. And so they'll pick their groups according to the prototypes they are interested in. And then the small group work will be during the prototype test and share phase. So my hope is that 
this strong work that we're doing at the beginning will help them with the small group because they can focus on really creating the prototype, trying it out, trying a new prototype, trying it out, and really um, have time for that um, iteration piece, which I sometimes think gets marked up because we are spending so time, so much time doing the part they're really comfortable with, which is the research part, um, because they've had a lot of experience with that. And so I'm hoping if we work together on those pieces, they'll be ready to take on some of the more challenge in a small group. So that's, that's sort of where we're going and what, how I'm gonna be trying to approach um, helping them think about the wicked problem. And so, as I mentioned earlier, I have a lot more about my thinking and about some of the resources I mentioned in this blog post, um, Empathy and Tackling a Wicked Problem. I think I wrote it in May <laughs> after I had just finished working with Martha. So, um, you know, those of you who are watching this recorded, if you have any questions about anything, feel free to just send me an email. I'd be happy to chat because it's something I'm still trying to figure out and would love other perspectives on it. Thank you, Elizabeth. That was so great. So this, this was great, Elizabeth. And you've I, I've just committed to